Hi, I'm Edgar, and today I'll be painting this Meng model's Sherman Firefly. It is a World War II's kit, and I built it up last week if you'd like to see how it went together. As you can see, I've primed the model already in grey, and I'll be giving it the basic base coats with an airbrush. This model will be joining my British Army for bolt action, even though it's not a true scale model and so I will be using the desert camo scheme that the M3 Grant at Bovington is wearing. This is my very favourite camo. It is quite anachronistic for a firefly to have this camo, as the camo pattern that I'm going to use was only used earlier on in the war, and the entire North African campaign ended in May of 1943, where the firefly didn't see service until early 1944. But it's also a cartoon tank, and it's hardly realistic to begin with. I started with an ochre paint over the entire vehicle, and then a subtle modulation with tan. This being to highlight the middle of each armour panel to emphasise the shape. Now, I was having all sorts of issues with the airbrush until I realised that I had left the pressure all the way down really low from the last time I was using it, and once I turned that back up to its normal level, it behaved a little better. Next I filled in the darker patches of camo, and I was trying to keep the overspray to as narrow as I could so that I could cover it with the lining later on. I could have used some form of masking, but that would just take 10 times as long, and I have a game this needs to be ready for. There was really no plan for where to place these patches, and I just kind of filled in bits here and there until nearly half of the model was in this darker brown. Well, let's move on to a real brush and do that lining that I mentioned. The camo pattern that I'm referencing has a double line separating the light and dark patches of colour. The black side of the double line borders the dark brown, and the white borders the tan, which isn't the way I might have thought it would be if I thought it through, and I might try it reversed at some point just to see how that looks. Now, white paint, having famously bad pigments, doesn't easily cover in one coat over most colours, but I have found the white that I use does coat very nicely over the grey paint that I use and I don't have to worry about the coverage of the black on the top, as the black goes nicely over everything anyway. What this means is that I can make my grey line nice and wide, and cover much of the region of overspray from the airbrushing. I tried, although I only managed it in a few places, to have a slight bit of the brown overspray over the line, and a slight bit of the visible tan on the other side. If I had managed to do this consistently, this would look like a nice effect that would emphasise the pattern, but it's kind of half there and it's fine, I might clean it up someday, but not today. After the big grey line was done all over the model, I went over it with the white, trying to ensure that my outer edge was nice and neat. It isn't nice and neat, but I tried. The black line was much more fiddly, now I need to have two edges to be neat, and the thickness of the black line needs to be consistent as well. This took forever. Easily more than half of the painting time of this tank was just the lining of the camo. Even if you include the airbrushing, which always takes me ages, because I need to clean it multiple times whenever I use it. But let's skip ahead to some of the more fun details, like some wood grain. I thinly base coated the bustle and stowage boxes with a lighter brown. Uh, the bustle is almost certainly not wood in reality, but I'm going for a cartoon mode, not realistic mode. A single thin coat is going to give me a slight inconsistency in the paint that will make the wood look more natural. Just remember, it's not two thin coats, it's thin coats until you achieve the effect you're after. For the wood grain itself, as if I haven't done enough lines on this model already, I'm going to do some more lining. Wood grain has a variety of colours and goes all the way down to fully black in a lot of woods, but this time I mixed a little bit of black into my dark brown to make for a slightly off black colour. And for the pattern? I had no plan, I just went for it. Happy to get an over-exaggerated wood grain effect that would match the cartoony style of the rest of the model. 
for some not lining now, thank you very much, uh, and some not brown as well. These stowage wraps all got a dark green, and I just quickly highlighted them with the dark green mixed with a little bit of light green. Just a single highlight layer, nothing too extreme. For some more brown, because of course there's more brown, the unditching logs. However, I have a way that I like to paint bark, which is to dry brush white over the top. There are loads of trees near me that have this white speckly pattern, and possibly it's just moss, I've never actually checked, but it looks distinctive and I quite like it. The headlights got my usual 1990s gemstone effect. I did think about painting these as eyes and giving the tank a cartoony face, but I thought better of it, that might be pushing a little too far. There is just one last detail that's needed to be painted in for a Sherman Firefly, and that is the barrel camo. The fireflies were usually painted green, but the extra long barrel that it had made it stand out on the battlefield, and the Germans learned to target the fireflies first before dealing with the other Shermans with the 75mm gun. And so the Brits started painting the front half of the 17 pounders barrel so that it would appear more like a 75. Now I have no idea if this was successful or not, but it is an iconic part of how these vehicles look and so I want to include it. I did some mock-up pictures with some different layouts. I wanted to put a light blue on the top to pretend to be the sky and a tan on the bottom to pretend to be the sands of the desert. However, the real fireflies had the green on the top, the green being their standard paint, and the blue was on the underneath. Now, as I've said before in this project, I'm not holding myself to history, but in this case, I did end up going for the blue on the underneath. Against my better judgment, perhaps, but it does work. Well, at this point, you're probably expecting me to give the model an entire dark wash and then edge highlight the feth out of it, because that's sort of how I've been painting all of my vehicles recently. However, I have sworn off using washes on my desert rats, as I want them to be bright models to show that they are in the bright sunlight. And, instead of a normal edge highlight, I had another idea that would lean even more heavily into the cartoony look. These pigment liners have been sitting in my 2D art supplies for decades, and finally they get to see the light of my studio lights for at least an hour before being put back away. Picking out an edge highlight of black, not a highlight as such, a, a high dark, a high shadow, a cartoony outline really, as if I haven't done enough black lining on this model, here are some more. But it's not the finishing touch for this model, as this kit comes with a little transfer sheet. And to save me from some freehanding, I've freehanded all that camo lining already today, I'm just going to use all of the transfers. For the most part, they are nice modern transfers. They work well, stick nicely, and have that slightly annoying shiny look that all transfers seem to still have. When they fix that, it will be an improvement. But there are some that caused issue. This hull ID number goes on the hull underneath this piece of stowage, but of course that means that it doesn't fit. I remove the transfer onto the backing card and I cut it down to size. And this usually ends in a disaster, shreds of the transfer and bits all over the place, but I actually managed to cut the transfer and then move it back to the model, put it into place with the cutout section where the stowage gets in the way, and it fits quite well. There was then also the star on the driver's up armor that has the same problem, and so I had to cut the top off of that to also make that fit. I could possibly recommend to not glue this stowage down, not for a painting subassembly, but for a transfer subassembly, which is not something I've ever considered before. I picked out a Desert Rats unit marking instead and put that on the front. And I was having so much fun with this model that I put the title from the Meng's transfer sheet on the underneath of the tank. And that's so that if I ever sell this model on or otherwise not own it, the future owner can see what this model is and who the manufacturer is. I might actually do this a little more often to identify not just what the model is, but the manufacturer as well. Well, here it is, all finished. My cartoony Sherman Firefly made by Meng models. It is not a historically accurate model, but it is not meant to be. It is meant to be fun, and it certainly is that. The tracks even still move, 
which is still more fun than it should be. Even with all of the spraying that went onto the wheels, they still turn freely, and I didn't even sub-assemble them. The kit, as I said last week, is a proper model kit, but it is sort of an easy build style, so it plugs together quite quickly, far more so than a display model kit. But of course, as a trade-off, it doesn't have the fine detail that those types of models have. As a cartoon tank, it doesn't need that type of detail, so that's appropriate. Overall, it's a silly idea, but it's done in a very sensible way, and I appreciate that. And just to throw this in at the end of the video, this model has already seen the tabletop in a tournament that I went to a little while ago now, and I'll leave a link in the description to my vlog of the event, because this model really did turn heads. It was the one that people kept pointing out and wanting to have a look at. Well, you can post your opinions below on this cartoony, fun little tank, but for now, I'm Edgar, always will be, and thank you very much for watching.